I'm honored to be here and share with you just a few stories of my first experience going to war. Everybody remembers their first kiss, the first time they fell in love, their first job, their first car. Uh, but I guarantee you that every serviceman that's gone to war and servicewoman that's gone to war, they remember the first time they go to war, the first time that they uphold that sacred oath. And I'd like a show of hands of those in the room that are veterans. If you go ahead and raise your hands. So I dedicate this talk to all the veterans that have served previously. And I give this talk in honor of you and in the many ways that you've served as well. So as you heard in my introduction, uh, I'm David Fujimoto and I'm just really, really happy to be here. What I'm gonna tell you about today is basically 2001. I'm gonna take you back 20 plus years. Uh, to where you were. So think about where you were in September of 2001. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my first experience going to war. So my first war was in Afghanistan. I know we have Vietnam vets in here. Uh, and it was something that I will take with me forever. Uh, I ended up going back to Afghanistan as late as 2014. So you'll see some symmetry in my story. So I'll give you a little bit of history. Uh, that black and white picture is not of me. That's a picture of my dad in 1960. My dad was enlisted in the Air Force and served in Air Defense Command. There's my dad and I at the Air Force Academy in 1989 and Parents Weekend. And there's a picture of me with the Secretary of the Air Force getting my diploma in 1993 from the Air Force Academy. But I was one of those kids that when I was a young child, I knew I was going to serve in the military, I just wasn't sure what branch. And when I was 13 years old, uh, I was looking around in the sky and I saw a bunch of airplanes and I started talking to my dad about that and I was hooked. For my 16th birthday, he bought me a plane ride in an open biplane. And I'm talking about the goggles, the scarf, open to the wind. And from that moment on, I knew I wanted to be a pilot. So I had a little bit of an interesting career in the Air Force before I went to Afghanistan. I started on nuclear alert for Minuteman III missiles. Everybody remembers the Cold War? Well, we have ICBMs that are on alert 24 hours a day. So my first assignment was actually up in North Dakota, very warm place, uh, about 100 feet underground. My next assignment was I went to flight school and I was a navigator in special operations on the MC-130. And its primary mission is to infiltrate and exfiltrate special operations forces as well as provide airdrop resupply and refuel helicopters. But I still hadn't achieved my dream. Well, fortunately, when I was a captain, I had the opportunity to go to pilot training and achieve my dream. And I got my number one choice out of pilot training, which was the AC-130 gunship. There's only 25 planes in the entire United States Air Force of AC-130, so I was really excited to go back to the special operations aviation community. So what is the gunship? What is a gunship? How many of you have seen the movie The Green Berets with, with John Wayne? Yeah, that's the, that's the kid's version, okay? I flew the adult version. And basically what it is, it is a C-130, which is a relatively large airplane, a little bit smaller than a 737, but it's full of armament, uh, specifically very large cannons. As you can see, I brought in some of the rounds that we might shoot out of a AC-130. So my version had two cannons on it, the 105 millimeter howitzer and the 40 millimeter Bofors. Um, these weapons started on ships or tanks or artillery pieces, so putting them on an airplane is pretty significant. We also have a lot of sensors. So that, we operate at night, so that means we have the ability to see in low light uh, conditions using infrared or special TVs. Uh, we also had the ability to be on night vision goggles and see through the night vision goggles, as well as uh, use certain infrared pointers to point things out to friendly folks on the ground. Um, and we also had the ability to fly above the weather. So in other words, we can't see the ground but the forces that we were supporting, they would have a piece of equipment and we could track them uh, on our aircraft. 
So the AC-130 in action, if we have time at the end, I'll show you a video. And this video actually includes some of the gun footage uh, from the missions that I flew in Afghanistan. But normally you would call the front end of the airplane the business end of the airplane. Well, in the gunship, it's actually in the back. So it has a crew of 14 people, which is a large crew on an aircraft. Um, so you'll see a picture of the two cannons right there from the outside, the two cannons from the inside. This is where we store some of the ammunition. This is where the sensor operators sit. And this is a picture, a still picture from our infrared camera. So September 10th, 2001, think about where you were. Uh, where I was, I was actually with the United States Navy. Okay, I was out of this place called Coronado. And part of my job as a liaison officer was to go to the Special Forces and Navy SEAL and Special Boat Unit and the Ranger units that we supported and teach them how to employ this aircraft on the battlefield. It, it is a, um, a very precise aircraft, but it requires a lot of coordination with the friendly troops on the ground. And one of the reasons is, is that we have the ability to employ munitions very, very close to friendly forces. So between 200 meters and one kilometer. So normally when an airplane comes and drops a large bomb, the friendly forces are not that close. But because we're employing crew served weapons that are very, very accurate, we have the ability to employ those weapons very close to the friendly forces. So this requires a lot of training both for the air crew as well as the forces that we support. So I was on an exercise called Ocean Vista. So I'm with SEAL Team 3 uh, and SBU 12, Special Boat Unit 12. And I'm basically teaching them how to, on a ship, a very small ship, a Mark V or a RIB, to employ the AC-130. Uh, they loved having an Air Force captain who was a pilot on their ship. Uh, they did everything they could in their power to maybe make me feel seasick or accidentally fall overboard. Fortunately, I was a pretty good swimmer. But really, really great time to bond with them and teach, teach them how to use the AC-130. The reason why we do things like this is because, lo and behold, when we go to war, these are the folks I would be supporting uh, over in Afghanistan and other places. But there are a couple of pictures of me um, on the ships. So I'm from New York. Okay. My father had worked in the Twin Towers. My brother took the Boston to LA flight on September 10th. My sister-in-law had an appointment in the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, but she had the flu. Okay, so when I talk about 9-11, being born and raised in New York and having so many familial connections, it's an visceral event for me. Uh, as it is most, most Americans. So this is where I was on September 10th. On September 11th, I was at the airport in a Continental jet. So I was getting ready to go home from my temporary duty. So I was not on a military airplane. Uh, my airplane was still out there, but I was not a passenger on it. And we had back, pushed back from the gate, taxied out, to the runway, and then the FAA ordered a ground stop. We taxied back to the terminal, and they let everybody off the airplane, me being a pilot, knowing that's a little bit unusual. And we all went back into the airport, and then every TV, you could see what was happening. Okay, About that time, my pager started going off, because we had to do, as every single military unit did, 100% accountability. Where is every single soldier, sailor, and airman especially those that are getting ready to be activated um, and potentially deploy. Uh, part, a portion of the Special Operations Force in the United States, every component is on alert, is on alert for certain incidents around the world. And so my unit had an alert commitment. And as the person that was in charge or primarily responsible for the liaison, between the Army and the Navy and their Special Operations Forces, that's why my pager went off. Because they said, oh boy, um, this is pretty serious. You need to come home, pack your bags, and then I'm sending you, sending you to a base overseas and then a base in North Carolina to start planning the nation's response to 9-11. 
So guess what? C-130s don't, they don't break any speed records, okay? In a direct flight from Fort Walton Beach, Florida, which is where I was stationed, to Karshi Khanabad, Uzbekistan, is 6,382 nautical miles. Well, guess what? We don't go in a direct flight. C-130 can fly for about five or six hours before it needs gasoline. So we made a lot of stops along the way. Um, I left Florida on November 11th. From October 11th to November 11th, I was traveling around the United States, around the world, planning this mission this set of missions that, that I was about to embark on. So I didn't have a lot of time at home after 9-11. Uh, we conducted a series of in-flight refuelings, and we made stop in Lages, Rota, Spain, a Navy base, Sigonella, another Navy base, and Suda Bay. And then we got to Suda Bay, which is in Crete, and we had to wait there for nine days. And I'm going to get ready to tell you why we had to wait there for nine days. But it's a far, far trip. It's basically the other side of the world from Florida. So what are we waiting for? So you remember Secretary of State Colin Powell, don't you? Okay. Do you know there's President Bush? Do you know who he's shaking hands with? Any ideas? This is a really tough question. I'm giving you a little hint. Anybody know what those flags are for? So this one's for Greece. So I told you I was waiting for nine days in Greece. Anybody know what that flag is? Uzbekistan. Okay, so this gentleman had to go visit the president of Uzbekistan. Remember your Cold War history, right? Uzbekistan was an ally of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union lost a war in Afghanistan. There hasn't been a lot of occasions where an American force would go base out of a former Soviet republic. Okay, so this guy, he wants money. So Secretary Powell brought four million dollars, one million dollar for each, one million dollars for each AC-130. Once that down payment was made, the president of Uzbekistan granted us the clearance to go land there and base out of there. So I, I titled this slide Waiting. So there's a picture of me waiting on the ramp because when we landed initially in Greece, we thought we were just going to get gas and continue on our way, right? This is two months after 9-11. The forces there on the ground, now remember, less than 100 Americans on the ground about the first six months. So CIA, Special Forces, Navy SEALs, those sorts of folks. Um, and their job was to partner with the Afghans that were going to fight the Taliban, the Northern Alliance in the north. Uh, and then President Karzai, or future President Karzai in the South. Not a lot of Americans were already in Afghanistan. So I'm waiting. So you figure that this is the United States Air Force, this is the United States military, we're at war. Secretary of the Defense, the President, they're on TV every day. So you would think we would get some super cool coded message and delivered in a folder and, hey, you're ready to go to war. You're ready. We know you've been waiting. So guess what? Guess when we found out we were going to leave Greece? CNN. So I don't know if you can see the bottom of that, but it says three U.S. Air Force AC-130 Spectre gunships. So, you know, we're killing time in Greece. We're learning how to eat Greek salads, right? Drink Greek liquor, right? Because who knows the next time you're going to have a drink. Um, you would think that we would get an official notice, but we're watching TV, we're watching CNN and listening to BBC, right? BBC was still broadcasting from Afghanistan. And so this is when we knew we had the clearance. Now they got the number of airplanes wrong, but as a special ops guy, I don't want to see this on TV. But this is when we knew we were going. So where did we go? So when I say we went to Afghanistan and participated in Operation Enduring Freedom, and we were part of a unit called um, TF Dagger, which was the task force in the north. If you can see up there, Uzbekistan, uh, it's a base in southern Uzbekistan, so a former Soviet republic. This sign was not there. This sign's from 2003, 
This is what the place looked like. Okay, so a former Soviet air base. Well, guess what? The Soviets also stored chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons there. So from an environmental perspective, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. Uh, very little running water, very little electricity. And I know there's some people here in the room that are Army veterans, and they always smile when they hear an Air Force guy talk about the living conditions. But when we first got over this base, it was pretty bare bones. It was pretty bare bones. So a little bit about camp life. So if you start up in the upper left, you see a line. That's what I remember about camp life. You had a line for everything. A line for a chow. A line to use the bathroom, if you had a bathroom. A line to use the shower, if you had a shower. A line to use the washing machine, if you had a washing machine. So we had lines everywhere, because there was nothing there there was very little infrastructure there, right? And it was, we're flowing the forces in. So we had 14 people in our tent, army style, right? All males. There's me. We were able to barter with some of the Uzbek Air Force folks there because they would trade. They would trade. And what, what are American GIs looking for? Alcohol, right? <laughs> A way to kill the time, something to read, okay? Um, so I was able to barter and buy an Air Force, a Soviet Air Force Major's hat. That's what I'm wearing in the right. But that's just a picture inside our tent. And you're saying, well, why are you guys all close together? Well, we were playing a game of risk. That's what we did to kill time. We played a game of risk. Here's all of us on the crew watching TV, or excuse me, watching a movie. Um, and then here's a gourmet meal in Afghanistan. So eventually we started getting care packages, so people would send tuna fish and, can, and canned goods and things like that. And we had our MRE, Meals Ready to Eat Crackers. And this guy is a chief, chief master sergeant. So it didn't matter if you were a lieutenant colonel, I was a captain at the time, or an airman. We all lived together as a crew. Um, we had some really talented artists, so we started doing what most GIs have done for the last 100 years. We started marking our territory. And so this is then Captain Farrell. He's a two-star general now. And that's where his tent, uh, that's where his crew was, was uh, housed. So more camp life, okay? This is before the snow. Anybody been to Uzbekistan? I didn't think so. It's not a, not a big tourist destination. So this is in November, right? And you said, hey, mud. Soldiers have been dealing with mud for hundreds of years, right? Yeah, but it's inside the tent. So you have a hard time getting dry. And then after this came the snow, right? So it was 20 or 30 degrees. So remember, everything's outside that you have to get to, your airplane, the restroom, the shower, the meals. Um, this is entertainment. We're watching somebody get their haircut. OK? That's entertaining. But everybody wants one of these haircuts, OK? This is Christmas Eve meal. I have an affinity for spaghetti, so I was really happy. Uh, these are our maintainers. Any good aviator is going to tell you that it takes a, gr a bunch of people for successful mission accomplishment. There's a ton of work and a ton of people that help us fly those successful combat missions. They were in a Connex, which is basically an empty rail car, OK, um, watching South Park. So mission preparation. So I have, in this part of the war, we experienced everything from somebody hands you a folder that has radio frequencies and satellite imagery and estimates of the, of the enemy's capability and nice graphics with where all the good guys are going to be. OK, that's the ideal situation. But at special operations, we need to be able to deal with that whole spectrum. The vast majority of the time, we got a sticky. Everybody knows what a sticky is, right? And it said, contact Texas 17 on 325.8. So that's a call sign and a UHF radio frequency. OK, so that's the, what we were launching into combat with in Afghanistan. But before we would take off, we had to, we had to learn a lot. So that guy in the black, he's our intelligence officer, right? So he's using all of those local and national and regional sources to get information to help us stay safe and be successful. 
We got a briefing from a survival specialist, right? What happens if you have to bail out or crash land? Where, where are the friendly spots? Where are the enemy spots? What can you eat? What can't you eat? Who's going to kill you on site? Who could you bribe? Right? So he's telling us all about that. And then probably most importantly is the chaplain. The chaplain would bless, bless every crew and bless every airplane before we took off. And so in the upper right, that's the chaplain saying grace. So what else are we waiting for? Hurry up and wait. Who's heard that? Well, there's hurry up and wait in the Air Force, too. Um, I talked about the C-130 being really, really slow. So the AC-130, we don't do any of our fighting unless it's nighttime. So often we'd get out to the airplane, we'd make sure um, it was in the condition that it needed to be, all the ammunition was loaded up, all the chaff and flares, some food, some personal survival gear, and what we'd do is build our nest. So we'd go in and go to our crew stations and get every, all this equipment laid out where we could reach it in flight. And then we waited, we waited. So there's me waiting. And what we're waiting for is sunset. So normally we took off at sunset, because it would take us about 30 minutes to get to the border of Afghanistan. So aircrew life. Everybody thinks being on an aircrew or pilot, it's really glamorous. You get to go to all the cool parties, you get really nice clothes, everybody wants to meet you, everybody wants to get your autograph. Flying an AC-130 is a lot like being a crew member in World War II. So think about the B-17s, because we fly unpressurized, okay? So every feet, every 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet you go up, the temperature changes. It gets colder. Anybody been mountain climbing? Right? So the oxygen is less, it's colder. So in our airplane, unpressurized, 20,000 feet, 22,000 feet, it's zero degrees, or minus 10 degrees, or minus 20 degrees. And so you'll see some of the crew members are in multiple layers of clothing and oxygen and survival equipment because if they took that off, they might get frostbite. And we did have a few crew members get frostbite. Uh, but there's me in the right seat as a co-pilot. Um, and I have a harness, night vision goggles, and survival vest on. Um, that's just the hero shot by the 105. This piece of equipment I'm carrying right here is a GPS, a G, uh, standalone GPS. So here's, here's one of our gunners. Can you see the thickness of his clothes? Okay, really, really cold back there. And this is the gun, the, the gun crew. You can see that they're on oxygen. So when you're above 10,000 feet in an unpressurized airplane, you have to be on supplemental oxygen. Okay, now imagine I turned off all the lights. So in the back of that airplane, it's pitch dark except for two green chem sticks. The sticks you get at Halloween and shake. Okay, there's one chem chemical stick on the breech of the aircraft, and there's one back here by the ammo ramp. Okay, now imagine I tilt the floor of the airplane 22 degrees. Then imagine you're backwards. That's the sort of environment they had to operate in during combat, because we had to turn off all the lights on the airplane, all the lights on the airplane, to make it more difficult for the enemy to see us. A very challenging environment to operate and, and fly in. Okay, I mentioned that the AC-130 has a really, really big crew. 14 people, five officers, nine enlisted. Um, all trained uh, very in, in a special manner. All of their duties are really, really important to the accomplishment of the mission. Um, and so this is just some of the various crew positions. This guy right here, he's our loadmaster. And you're going, well, what is he doing? Is he sightseeing? No. He's laying down in a sleeping bag when we're in this orbit, and he's looking down at the ground, and he's looking for flashes of light. He's looking for missile trails, flashes of light, and he's got his hand on a flare dispenser. Okay, so his job is to look, look for uh, enemy AAA and enemy missiles coming up at the airplane. So for me, in my first deployment, the operations were basically divided into two, into two phases, if you will. Operations in the north, operations in the south. So operations in the north, we were primarily supporting the special forces, okay, that were supporting this guy. Where's my Uzbek historians? This is General Dotsdam, okay, he was the commander of the Northern Alliance. So remember I said there was about 100 Americans on the ground. 
So it was not the 82nd Airborne. It wasn't the first infantry division that went in in 2001 and 2002 that took over Afghanistan. It was American special operators and CIA partners partnering with the forces on the ground, the indigenous forces on the ground, going against the Taliban and al-Qaeda. Okay, so that's General Dodston. That's a member of 5th Special Forces Group. Okay, and so they would go out, set up some equipment, and help find the enemy. Then they would call us in to do um, some close air support and armed reconnaissance. You all have heard of the horse soldiers, right? Okay, that, that's an airman. It's an Air, For air Force guy, combat controller. Again, moving around like the locals. So some of the battles that I fought in were in Mazar Sharif, Kanduz, north of Kabul, Jalalabad, and Asadabad. So all those areas where there were still pockets of Taliban or Al-Qaeda, and our special forces partnered with the Afghans were going after them, basically closing in on them. Anybody know about Scott Spann? Have you heard that name before? Scott Spann was the first ground, American ground casualty in OEF, Operation Enduring Freedom. Scott Spann was a member of the CIA. And he was, like I said, he was partnering with the, the Northern Alliance. Well, they had captured a bunch of Taliban, okay? And they put him in this prison in Mazar Sharif. Well, the Taliban said, hey, we don't want to be here, right? So we're going to have a riot. And they had a riot. And they basically were able to secure some weapons. And so the Taliban outnumbered the Northern Alliance and the Americans that were there and the CIA folks. And so they quickly had to evacuate this prison. So now you have four to 500 armed Taliban. So what does a good American soldier do when they get into trouble? They call in air support. Where's the gunships? And so uh, we had some folks that within 12 hours, 13 hours of landing that long journey, they were put into crew rest and then they were called out to this mission to fly over the, uh, over the, the prison and suppress this riot. Um, I was number three, three, three or three gunships uh, that night to help suppress this riot at the prison. Operations in the south. Uh, again, places that I flew were Bagram, Erzgan, Kandahar, and south of Bagram. Uh, this part of Afghanistan is very famous. It's called Nixon's Nose. We'll come back to that later, because that's where the last bastion of al-Qaeda senior leadership and Osama bin Laden went in December of 2001. So who were we supporting in the south? Again, Navy SEALs, Special Forces, Rangers, okay, and their job was to partner with this guy. You know who this is? Can you see that? It's Harmid Karzai, before he was president. Okay, so he led the Pashtun force in the south that was pushing up from, Can took over Kandahar, pushed up towards the capital in Kabul. So again, uh, Americans partnering with their host nation groups, if you will, insurgent groups, rebel groups, partnered with American air power. Um, towards the end of November and December 2001, uh, our airplanes also had the opportunity to work with what's called black soft forces. So you have white special ops forces and black special ops forces. The black special ops forces, their primary role is counterterrorism. Specifically, they go after high leaders um, in Al Qaeda, ISIS, and such. So, number one on that list, right, is Osama bin Laden. And we had a lot of intelligence that he basically went to this area called Tora Bora. Uh, this was probably some of the most difficult fighting um, from an airman's perspective, but also from a ground perspective, um, because they were in caves that they had successfully d defended against, against the Soviets. So just north of Nixon's nose, you can see how steep the terrain is, okay? Um, the second closest time I came to dying in that airplane was in Tora Bora, because an American B-52 did not clear underneath his altitude and dropped about 50 Mark 82s through, through our orbit. Um, that was the second closest time. Um, so we chased him up there. You had some soft forces go after. 
go after them. Um, I put this picture in there because in a good American aviation tradition, we were keeping a tally of our missions. So how many enemy did we kill? How many vehicles did we destroy? How many surface-to-air missile sites did we take out? And so this is one of our maintainers uh, making that tally on the side of the aircraft. So each individual was 10, 10 enemy killed. Who knows who General Mosley is? Where my ag's at? Where my Aggies at? Yeah, General Mosley retired as the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, right? Well, before he was in that position, he was the CFAC. So that means he was the senior airman all over all the coalition air forces um, operating out of the CAOC. So one night, we, we took off and we got that sticky that said contact this, this call sign, I think it was Pac-Man, on 327.8. So a, a call sign and a frequency. We didn't know who Pac-Man was. We're looking through the big list. We don't know who that is. Well, it turns out it was a predator, okay, being flown from the United States. And so the predator had found where some of their Al-Qaeda senior leadership was, um, and they helped us get our sensors onto that target, and we were able to engage the building and kill those senior leaders. Well, unbeknownst to us, there was another platform that was recording this mission. They were recording this mission. Um, so we came back, we gave a debrief, and they confiscated our tape. So every night we had a VCR tape that would record our radio calls and, and assess our battle damage. So it, it got confiscated. So we thought that was really weird. The next night we flew another mission, and we came back, and there were 14 of these notes on our bunks. So that mission had such importance that that tape was brought to the Situation Room at the White House. Um, and this senior Air Force general was thanking us for what an important, that we executed it really well, um, and he was thankful that, that we had done that mission in such an excellent fashion. So that was kind of nice. Um, and I've gotten to show this to General Mosley since a couple times, so I thought that was pretty neat. So coming home, right, that's always bittersweet. Um, there's a picture of the crew there. Uh, three of those folks are not with us anymore. They've, they've passed away. Um, I, I won't forget any of them. I won't forget this experience. Uh, I mentioned I was from New York, um, and we had another member of the crew that was from New York as well. So when we fly and we fight, the brass stays in the airplane stays in the airplane. And so we said, you know, what a great way to show uh, those first responders in New York City um, and elsewhere that we were there defending them, carrying on, um, getting some retribution, if you will, from 9-11, protecting our country. So a few members of our crew actually brought brass to places, places that we knew, first responders that we knew. Uh, so this is me in my house in January 2002, a lot younger, right, with my deployment mustache that we, that we all did. And that piece of brass is right here. Okay, so this is a 105. And this is from a mission on the 20th December against a, a convoy of Al-Qaeda. And if I have a chance to show the video, I'll show you the strike on that convoy. Operation Anaconda, I was home going through aircraft commander school, which means I was moving from the right seat to the left seat, uh, but a very, very famous battle that the AC-130s were also involved with, um, as again, Al-Qaeda senior leadership was fleeing Afghanistan. This took place in March of 2002. So I talked to you a little bit about my first deployment to Uzbekistan and Afghanistan, okay? And I titled this side, Would It Ever End? Over the course of my career, I had 12 deployments. 10 of them were after 9-11. Um, so a total of six times to Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. The latest time was in 2014. But I also got to visit some other garden spots like Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, and Africa. Uh, not always flying gunships, 
Uh, I was qualified in another airplane towards the later part of my career. And as I moved up in rank, a um, little less flying and more staff work in the headquarters, special operations headquarters, or a liaison to a host nation, uh, again, discussing special operations. So the last time I went to Afghanistan was in 2014. Uh, and this was a real privilege to go back as a lieutenant colonel and serve with COM ISAF. So that means the commander, the senior American general there, COM US4A. In this case, it was General Campbell. He was the vice chief of staff of the Army. And I got to serve on his commander's action group as the air and soft liaison. A superb, superb general. A nice bit of synergy. I'd been out of country 10, 10 years. So the AC-130s, specifically the AC-130s from my unit at Florida, they went to Afghanistan the first time in 2001. Okay, They came home in 2017. So 16 years longer than the Vietnam War, my squadron of, of eight airplanes at that point was deployed. Not the same people. We rotated through. Um, so you could see how much in, of demand there was for this particular aircraft. Um, this is kind of the totals of the impact of the AC-130 just between 2001 and 2013. Uh, 6,500 missions and over 4,600 enemy killed. The AC-130 that I flew, that, that type of airplane built in 1969, they retired those aircraft in 2015. And then the unit pulled out. They started to retire in 2015. The unit left Afghanistan permanently in 2017. Uh, I know this is going to come up, and we're going to have a chance for questions. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Somebody's going to ask me about this. And I know there's some Vietnam vets in here. A ton of parallels. Not exactly the same, but there are some parallels. Um, and I do have a lot of mixed feelings. Not about my service. Uh, it was the greatest honor of my life. Um, but the way it ended, the way we, we ended the war as a nation. <clears throat> so I'll leave it with this, and then I'll tee up the video. So this is the back of what's called the PE bin in the AC-130. And the AC-130 has a proud combat legacy going back to the Vietnam War. Okay? And we have been in every major and minor conflict in between Vietnam up through Syria you know, what, where they're operating um, now, okay? And so we have a lot of talented folks in, in art. There's a lot of art associated with airplanes. Um, and if you remember that picture of me sitting on the ramp, um, waiting, waiting for that clearance to go, I had a grease pencil. And so this shows some of the places previously that we had fought. And then uh, in, in a bit of air crew humor where that question mark is as I wrote Bin Laden. Now we never got him. We left that to the Navy SEALs about 10 years later. Um, but super proud to be part of this legacy of combat, uh, not only the first time, but the other times. So with that, I'm just going to pause, and then I'm going to go ahead and show a, about four minutes of a video where you can actually see an AC-130 in action. Now, you will not hear. This is a sanitized version, so you will not hear the sound of the aircraft. You will not hear the... The, the radios, the internal communications, or the external communications. So this video was actually made by some Special Forces folks, and it's a little bit of a tribute to those that they lost there the first year of the war, 2001 and 2002. So this is um, sensor footage of the AC-130, and uh, about half, it, half of it is missions that I flew on. So you have some symbology in there about where the sensor is aiming, what gun is armed, the bank angle, the speed of the aircraft, the altitude of the aircraft. That's a bridge right there. So we had some uh, enemy snipers that were underneath the bridge. So more, more than likely, there's friendly forces that are a kilometer or two away. So they're watching this through their own night vision goggles. And they're, they're making assessments about how effective our strikes are. So they're adding information that we, we calculate back in as we, as we use, uh, go to adjust fire. 
This was kind of a weapons storage area that the Taliban was using, and you could see very quickly it caught fire. This is at the Kandahar Airport when the Taliban still owned it. I was on this mission. In this corner, it's hard to see. Those are SA-3 missiles uh, in garrison. So big, big surface-to-air missiles, not, not pointed at the airplane, but in garrison. Um, I was reading a summary of this mission yesterday, and this is the, the time that we came closest to dying. Um, prior to this, that shoot, we had been engaged with two surface-to-air uh, man-pad missiles. And then after that explosion, you can imagine it lit up the bottom of our airplane, and we had somebody else come out and shoot at us. Um, this is the IR pointer called the ISLID, and we were talking with two F-18s from the Navy, and we were pointing to where we wanted them to drop their bombs. So just on the fly, we figure out some of these things and able to work cross-service. Uh, Navy conventional pilots, us being special operations forces. This was a Taliban tank farm. So you could see some of the tanks. Uh, a 105 won't totally destroy a tank, but we can make it inoperable, especially if we damage the gun or the, or the treads. This was the mission I was talking about, where the Al-Qaeda senior leaders were, that the CFAC sent us that note. This is the one that went to the, to the White House Situation Room. And we sh I don't know if you saw the first round. It was a penetrating round, so it went through the roof, let's say hit the floor and it blew out all the windows. It probably killed all the people on the first floor. And then the roof subsequently collapses and then there's some folks that start escaping. This is in Tora Bora. So if you can see how steep the mountains are and we're shooting over here, but the bad guys were in a series of caves. So you'll actually see smoke and fire coming out the other side of their tunnel. Very, very challenging, very challenging to fly in that terrain. We're not that high uh, above the ground, maybe 6,000 feet above the mountains. The mountains were up to 22, 24,000 feet, um, sometimes lower than, that, uh, lower than that, the aircraft. Um, this is the one, this is in Kanduz. So I think this was my first night of combat. And I counted, I think it's seven guys, Taliban, that come out of this car. You see four of them have already come out. Uh, we call this the clown car. Not to be funny, but that's how we described it because there were so many people packed in this car. The special forces element was on the other side of the river and they basically said, if you are east of the, west of the river, excuse me, they're bad guys, bad guys. Um, so we nicked the car, you'll see the car explode and then we can start chasing, chasing the, the Taliban fighters. So the airplane is orbiting, it's called a pylon turn, so we're doing a big circle in the sky, big circle in the sky, and we just move that circle a little bit, all while the guns and the sensors are still pointed down. So we're, we're watching them um, move, and so we just make a slight adjustment, and then the guns go down, and it's like shooting a big rifle in the sky. So some secondaries there, and then... Um, a lot of bad guys here, a lot of bad guys. <clears throat> One of the things that was really, I guess, confusing for the Taliban is, you know, we're trying to be quiet, uh, we're dark, and they're not used to an airplane like this. So if they can't hear us and they can't see us, when those things explode, a lot of time it's a surprise, obviously, and then they think it's artillery coming from some other place. It takes them a while to figure out that it's coming from the air. And eventually our aircraft um, got a nickname and it basically loosely translated to spitting witch. I can't say it in, I think it was Pashtun, but I, it translated to spitting witch. And the, and the special forces guys, when they would capture them, of course do an interrogation and they told us, you know, they, they would give us feedback about our missions. Um, I think there's one more here. I wanted to talk about the convoy. Um, and so there was a time that we were following a convoy that was trying to escape into Pakistan and a big, long convoy of SUVs, again, Taliban. And uh, we were able to successfully strike, strike that convoy as well. 
Um, the weird thing is that the results of that mission actually were on CNN the next day. So I got to see it from CNN's perspective. Of course, everything at night is green, right? I'm looking for night vision goggles. The folks looking through the IR sensor, this is the, I think the TV in this case, yeah. So we have black hot or white hot. In this case, it's black hot. So you can see the person up there. You can see the person over there. And so sometimes we switch between the sensors depending on the weather, depending on the environment. Sometimes it's easier to see the targets when it's white hot or black hot. And these are folks escaping the, the convoy and they're trying to find these bushes. Um, but they don't realize that we haven't lost sight of them. So you see how they were hiding under that bush?